conference. I think you know, Elena has been it's been fabulous working with Elena. It's been very helpful with setting things up, but it is a different scale of conference. Okay, the physical LPC is five hundred people. That's small for compared to some conferences. It's a lot bigger than Cauldron. I remember Cauldron has run usually by support from the host. When we go to Prague, we run it in the university because that's where Homsa works. When we go to the UK, we're small enough conference we can fit into unusual places like, you know, Head and Bridge Town Hall. Um, and quite often the venues, you know, when we were at Cambridge, Cambridge University gave us all those venues for free. So there is an element that our cost base is kept very, very tight. I think something like 80% of the cost of a cauldron is the food and drink. That's about it. Um, and a significant other chunk is the T-shirts. Um, so it is, I don't think we'd see any cost savings. And I think we would switch as we've talked anyway to more particular model. The other difference is that Cauldron's held over a weekend. And for participants for whom compilers is not their day job, that's actually an advantage that they don't take out time during the week. Um, I'm actually finding it harder this year just because I'm used to, I can sort of bolt on Cauldron at a weekend and it doesn't get under my feet as during the, the, the ordinary working day. Um, and I do appreciate the comment from having to come in early, Carlos's comment about having to come in early. So I don't, I don't think there's a cost saving there at all. Yeah, okay, thanks, Jeremy. But there is also the, the matter, oh, sorry. There is also the matter of, of the price because this year LPC is quite affordable because it's remote, but usually in order to attend, uh, you have to pay like uh, a few hundred of euros. And up to now, as far as I know, the cauldron has been always free for attendance. That was my question. I remember, I think last year or maybe the year before, there was considerable pushback on even considering a, you know, maybe like a $20, $30 fee for the cauldron. And now we've had this $50 fee for, for this. And I'm wondering if that's um, uh, made a difference in the, in the people, in the, in the um, uh, attendees. Well, I'll say, I mean, two things. One is that people have, I mean, the Guido Toolchain Fund has sponsored at least students in the past. I'm not sure if we're, we're sponsoring this year. There's been some, you know, there was at least some requests early on. Um, I mean, I agree about the, the fee. I mean, I won't go in and get into all of the, um, the, the underlying issues about that. But, I mean, there was some concern about, um, I mean, just the way that some corporations are set up to fund this and to, to sponsor it, where... Um, and, and the number of people attending. So part of it was a balance between um, sponsorship versus people paying some sort of uh, a fee if there are a, a lot of uh, attendees from a, a particular organization that doesn't have uh, a, a lot of sponsorship. So it, it, it needs to be a, a balance, but I, I, agree, I agree about the uh, um, how, how to make this cost effective and, and, and affordable and accessible for everybody. There was a just to, I'm not, I don't think uh, Matt is here, but the, the the there is a general comment about the way we fund at the moment. We've been funded for years by very very generous support from our sponsors, and those sponsors actually stepped in this year to bail us out after we spent a lot of money setting up um, and making commitments. Because even though we only pay for the food, we do have to commit we're going to buy that food to the venue quite a long time in advance and pay a deposit and four of our sponsors stepped in to bail us out because we would have wiped out our very small reserves on the costs of this year so one of the feedback from the big sponsors is it is a lot easier to justify a 300 dollar ticket to attend a conference than it is to extract thousands of dollars to pay for your staff to go to those to a sponsorship even though it would actually be cheaper to pay the sponsorship. Um, so there is a suggestion that we that it will make our sponsor's life a lot easier if we charged a ticket price and just use the sponsorship to support those who are not paid for by their companies. Because quite honestly, if your company is going to pay for your airfare and your hotel, then the cost of a cauldron ticket is not that is relatively not that high. And I think the idea would be if your company pays, they can pay for the ticket. If they don't pay, then it would be free and the sponsorship would be much smaller but cover those free people. Mm -hmm.
one one of the issues that people have raised in the past is about locations, about having the cauldron in the U.S. and and difficulty for some people getting here. Would that be an issue if we were to co-locate with LPC? Because aren't most of those or a lot of those held in the U.S.? We try to. Can you hear me now better? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, we try to alternate. We do Europe one year and the U.S. another. I mean, it's, it's it's great to talk about this this coordination, and we hope that there is you know additional coordination going forward between uh, the um, Linux Foundation, Linux Plumbers Conference, and the GNU Tool Chain. Um, are there any? And I want to make sure that given that we have a this abridged version of the the, the Q and A, if there are any other questions, I mean, we're happy to continue this discussion. Just want to make sure that everybody's voices, everybody's uh, you know, thoughts are are included in this session. I mean, obviously, the uh, I mean, the, the the leadership here is and steward steering committee is available. You know, all throughout the year for any other questions. Just if anybody wants to to answer a, a broader um, you know, root conversation about a topic. I, I have a I have a question. So the, the GNU Toolchain Fund. Um, is that new? I, I'm not familiar with that. When did that come about and what is it and how do you decide what to fund? Yeah, so the, the Toolchain Fund is was created relatively recently that the uh, Free Software Foundation a few years ago created a um, an opportunity for individual organizations and groups to have um, um, directed funds and selected funds underneath the umbrella of the Free Software Foundation um, general account. So instead of having just a general pot of funds and going to the, uh, the Free Software Foundation for funding everything, that, that both the organizations and donors could direct funds to specific groups. And so uh, I, with, with the help of Joel from the GDB and Carlos from GLibc uh, created the GNU Toolchain Fund under the auspices of the FSF, and so we, the three of us, are the the trustees and uh, you know, have consensus for the the use of the funds. Also, as we uh, announced, I think it was I guess a, a year or two ago that. Um, a, a large donor came forward to the FSF to fund the FSF and um, 10 different projects within the FSF. So the FSF received over a million dollars and that was distributed to the different funds. So the GNU Toolchain Fund has uh, some donations, has received a, a modest amount of donations from uh, individual donors and one can donate through the, the FSF. Uh, and then there was this larger $100,000 that was received, well, I guess it's 90,000 because the FSF will take 10% up the top, but um, for the, uh, the GNU Toolchain Fund and nine other uh, organizations, other projects under the GNU Toolchain. And so um, we're, again, using that, we funded um, some of the students last year for travel. Um, I mean, as you understand, it's it you know it, it, it's a matter of not not just sort of saving this for, forever and ever, but also trying to use this prudently. For example, you know it's it's not enough money to continually pay for you know a scholarship or a sponsorship or a uh, of, of a student in a university. I mean, it's not that level with a with a one shot, but uh, um, you know to be able to utilize it for some you know, key areas, as as I mentioned with. You know, Autocomp, a couple other projects with this Rust bounty. Um, it, it's not something where we're looking to, again, and we don't want to get in. And it's you know, it's 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 ill-advised to get into the process of um, you know paying developers and paying maintainers out of this. It's not you know how open source projects generally work, but but to okay. to look at key key focus areas. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. The the fund has been in operation for for four years now. I think if I look back at the at the records, we've been four years um, trying to su supporting students to come to Cauldron if they needed help. 
um, and trying to support initiatives where we could. So I think the new auto conf is an interesting one because it's a very specific focused initiative to, to do a revitalization effort, but the subsequent, um, you know, uh, recurring engineering is really for the community to do, but they need help getting to the point where they're ready. Can I just clarify one thing for Catherine? The funding of the GNU tools cauldron is completely separate. It's nothing to do with this. That's what just I thought. Clear. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. That will, when I can finally get the lawyers sorted out, is will be actually a separate UK-based community interest company. Um, yeah. I'm when are you going to get that done, Jeremy? Uh, I've I've been reading impenetrably dense law things about charity law and so forth. In principle, it's very simple. Simple. I think we've got it sorted now. I now just need to find the time to put it on company's house to make it happen. We know who the directors will be. We know how to do all the stuff. It's just getting over that first hurdle. There's all sorts of rules about what you can call yourself if you're a CIC, etc. And we're trying not to fall into those particular pitfalls. Um, but yeah, I had had. I always hope to have it done before Cauldron. Um, and uh, I'm. It's just. It's one of those things that once I get it done, it'll all run smoothly. It's just getting over that first hurdle. Uh, so I have a question for all the committees and the stewards. Should we all change our version numbers to match each other? <laughs> no. I was going to say, Catherine, I know you well enough that I know when you're being sarcastic, but go on. <laughs> no, I don't have a strong opinion. <laughs> I, I think if we change the version numbers, we'd also have to make sure we all upgrade in sync. We all release in sync. So who's present from the bad old Cygnus days when we actually used to do synchronized releases where people could say all these components worked well together and we had the unified tree? How much work was that? Probably a lot. Well, back in the day, I used to do merges every month, keeping everything in sync so that we could then do a, a single release. Well, I mean, there, there was the, you know, at the time, I mean, the, the Cygnus, I mean, the, you know, and then um, with Code Sorcery, they also had a specific release um, of, of, a, of a unified tool chain. I mean, yep, we still do. Did I hear correctly that GDB is going to change the number to match GCC? Did I miss that? That is, uh, well, not the number, but the numbering scheme. Yeah. OK. <laughs> OK, I misunderstood that. So not the number. You're not going to release GDB 11 all of a sudden? No, the next one is GDB 10. And then the next one after that will be 11. Yeah, OK. We dropped the, you know, the minor release number. So it's Going to be GDB 10.1, then 10.2, 10 10.3, 10 and those will be bug fix releases. The next major release will be 11, just like GCC. <laughs> <laughs> but the numbers are a coincidence. It's the the format that we're following. Yeah, yeah. D DJ does raise a point that like glibc is one number off from the Fedora number in terms of minor, so people are always really confused by that. Uh, but it doesn't matter to me. But I, th I think to someone's point, you know, we could probably get to publishing data on what tool sets are used together. And when we build glibc and we do a glibc release, we actually try pretty hard to say these are the things we use to build it, or these are the most recent versions that work with glibc, so that the, at least from the glibc uh, install data that we have, it goes and shows you what what can be used with what. So, okay. So nobody wants to change all our version numbers around to to make matching version numbers. Yeah. Well, let me just add that, like, GDB is going to be 10. It's a coincidence that GCC is at 10 as well. But GDB has a six-month cadence. So we'll have two releases per year. Well, GCC has one per year. So in, in a couple of years, we'll be, like, in GDB 13, while GCC will still, still be in 11, 12. Right? So that's the release cadence aspect as well. Yeah, David Malcolm raises the question about calendar year-based numbering. And David, so I'm an ex-sorcerer, so I used to work for, for Code Sorcery and Mentor Graphics, but that's how we did it. That's how it's still done, I imagine, right, Catherine, at, at Mentor, 
which is uh, like a 2020 Q1 tool chain, 2020 Q2 tool chain, right? Or have you changed that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah we, it's still, we still do that. Yeah, it's because customers, they just wanted to know. Users just want to know, OK, is this the 2020 Q1 tool chain with all the pieces that work together? Yeah, OK, well, then we'll use that. Um, and there is, um, I mean, there's precedent here. I mean, Eclipse does a unified release, despite the fact that they have hundreds of separate projects. So Eclipse has, um, they release a project platform, so. All right, I see Mark. Mark, you want to say something? Go. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. But uh, apart from the first endeavors, I, I think having things more in sync would be nice. I did some patches for BFD and Liberty, Lipid Bert. I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, uh, anyway, Nick was nice enough to then backport the BFD changes to Binutil, so I know they are. Uh, they will get in the next release of Binutils, but I don't know when GDB picks them up, so I have to ping there. And uh, it it would be nice to have more integration. So anyways, I would, I, go, go ahead, Pedro. I mean, just we're, we need to wrap up because. Uh, OK, OK. So uh, go, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to shut up. So, so anyways, uh, thanks everybody for participating in this uh, abridged version of the uh, GCC steering committee and stewards uh, Q&A session. And uh, thanks for the, the great comments in the chat. And we'll continue to uh, have this discussion uh, later. And I mean, everybody's welcome to you know continue the conversation. I guess we can go to one of the, the breakout rooms. I want to take away from the rest of the sessions here, or we can uh, I said throughout the rest of the year, continue to discuss these interesting topics and come to, uh, to a consensus. So thanks, everybody, Carlos, all the stewards for participating, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. And then again, thanks to uh, LPC for, for sponsoring this and allowing us to, to hold this, uh, this virtual conference this year. It's been great, and with the great support of Elena and uh, the rest of the staff. And Okay, thank you, David, and everyone else participating. So now we have five minutes uh, until the next session, which will be the LVM and uh, GCC both. Can you guys hear me better now, or same disaster? You're better now. You definitely have more volume. Okay. Good, good, good. Uh, in anticipation of this session, um, could I have a volunteer to take the shared notes? We've been taking notes on each boff and they get pushed up onto the um, LPC platform at the end of the day. Um, since I'm leading the LVM GCC BOF, I can't take notes at the same time. So if anyone would care to volunteer, that would be appreciated.
Okay, two minutes to start. Okay, so let's just start. Okay, thank you, Jose. The, um, so welcome to the LLVM GCC BOF. Um, we've run these sessions in one or two places um, over the last year or so, conscious that people seem to be working on both projects and wouldn't it be nice if we could actually try and share some of the effort. So we ran uh, a session at last year's GNU Cauldron, we ran a session in the LLVM dev room at FOSDEM uh, this spring. And this is an opportunity um, to run this discussion uh, at LPC where we might have a bigger spread of uh, LLVM people than we usually expect. Um, I'm going to try and just remain as a facilitator, but I couldn't resist the chance of playing with the poll feature. So, um, I'm going to ask a few questions and you should see in a moment your options to respond to the poll. So if you'd like to answer the poll and we'll just give it a few moments. So hopefully people are generally using GCC and LLVM. I'm hoping we're going to get some LLVM users in this particular poll. Um, I will just give it a moment or two for you to answer. and. Um, Okay, people who are going to speak have spoken. Let's have a look at the poll. So, um, a mixture of people here use GCC or both. Um, a couple of people who just use LLVM and one person who doesn't use either GCC or LLVM, which is an interesting result. Um, so, next question related to that. Um, do you develop GCC and or LLVM? And I did interpret this quite broadly you can count as a developer if you have patches committed to improve the documentation, um, as well as taking a special bonus point for that, quite honestly. Um, so, uh, yeah, do you develop either of these tools? Fascinating. We're getting more developers than we actually have users. I'm not sure what to make of that particular response. Um, here's the polling results. Um, I'll go through this quite quickly. So, of course, not surprisingly, a lot of GCC developers here, quite a few LLVM developers and a, a small number who've done both. And not to be, uh, yeah, uh, some people, of course, who don't develop, who are here for other tools. Um, which leads me on to another question. It, they're not the only tools in the stable. Now, this may break the polling system. Um, so I'm just going to put together a custom poll. Uh, uh, a oh, right. okay so okay this is going to be interesting because i can't i can't have a six-way poll i didn't realize that so i'm afraid if you do llvm bin utils you cannot answer this poll um so um there we go
Okay, so we'll slow down. So that was the bottom yeah, box. Yeah, we could only select one option. Yes, I realised yeah. that, and I didn't. Re I'm afraid the only uh, I, the training session, and I did do, try to do a little bit before, and then broke the system. Um, I wasn't aware that it is an either or poll. So perhaps the answer has to be pick the one you think is most exciting to talk about. So I could run that poll again and say, if you answer one of those and want to answer another, does anyone want to answer a second? Poll? And we can we can do that again. So we'll start this poll and I'll start it again. I'm sorry you can't do NLVM bin utils. I have no way of fixing that. Tell me which your second choice is of other tools you use. Okay, so last time we got bin utils and, and GDB, and this time round, yeah, we get more people using LLD. Interesting, no polls, no one has their first priority or second priority using LLDB. Um, uh, I'm going to Jeremy, Jeremy, you were missing yeah. the F F option from your poll. Yes, and I, I know, and if you oh, tell okay. me how to add the F, because I, I try to do a custom poll, but it only lets me have five slots. Oh, that's beyond my skills here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can, I was, I can try. I'll try in another window, but you continue. I'll carry on. We we can come back. And so the um, and then the question is, how many people develop on this? And I'll ask this question. So first of all, first choice, which is the main tool you mainly develop? If you develop any of them, um, start a poll. Okay. And again, I'm sorry, LLVM bin utils is going to be left out of this. Okay, so of developers, lot of bin, lot of bin util developers here. A few LLD developers. Interestingly, we've got an LLDB developer, though LDB user and GDB. So I'll ask that poll again. And this is if you've answered to one of this and you have a second tool you work on, you can declare your second tool now. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that's slowing down. Let's publish the polling results. So we actually have people. So people do work on LLD, LLDB, and uh, there's a bit of work on LD we see coming on, and a little bit of work on LLD. But bin, general GNU bin utils is the big one, and GDB. So that's a useful uh, set of questions. Not quite going quite how I planned. So I want to try and not just repeat what we've said before, but give a starting focus for. The ongoing discussion okay so how ideas that we've had for joint work on language standardization uh our joint work on language standardization joint work on maintaining abi compatibility work on interability between tools and libraries and i think we picked up from one or two talks this week the idea of building with gcc and in linking with lld um and communication channels shared bugzilla joint mailing lists so those four areas have come up consistently. They came up last year at Canoe Cauldron. They came up at FOSDEM. And in order to prioritize our talks, I've got only two more polls, and this is the first of them. And I'm afraid there isn't an option to say none of the above because a starter poll, so you can't say none of the above. You've got to make a decision. Uh, so, yeah, and what we'll do is we'll focus the conversation around these priorities. Um, okay.
Okay. So, oh, no, there's a few more coming in. Right, that seems to stabilize. That's interesting there. There's a clear feeling here. Two thirds of the answers are around ABI compatibility and interoperability. So I'll now open the floor for comments. Quite a few of you, 17 of you thought interoperability is top priority. What I'd ask is for the floor to comment on what are what what can we do to improve interoperability? What are the mechanisms we should do? What are concrete efforts um, at the, that we can we can do? What what where should, what should we do? Suggestions? Um, the floor is now open. Uh, so um, uh, there is a question rather than a comment. Can you use LLD when linking GCC using LTO? Um, and I don't know the answer to that. Nick, what, how would you like to comment? Yeah, just a, a curious idea I've been playing with is, you know, I, I see how unit tests are written in, in LLVM. I'm kind of curious to see um, maybe in, in bin utils, for instance, like, what the kind of testing framework is like, because I'd be curious to play around with, can we try to collaborate on a shared um, test suite? Particularly, I, f I find compatibility with GAS kind of lacking in LLVM, and I would like to be more proactive about making sure that um, Clang's integrated assembler is, is uh, supportive of, of uh, or interoperable um, kind of thing. And, and there's a couple of places where I see even like for specific ICEs, like some of the architecture extensions are diverging a little bit or, you know, have different names in, in between the two different tool chains. And I think that makes it very frustrating to try to write um, kind of tool chain portable assembler code right now. Okay. Um, so uh, to, to address Nick. that. Yep. <laughs> um, the bin utils don't have any unit tests at the moment, but they do have test suites that you can run. Um, I am now running the linker test suite using Clang as, it, as the C compiler for the tests, but it still tests the bin utils linker at the moment. Um, but it, that is possible, and it is it's certainly theoretically possible to, for example, run the gas test suite using um, LLVM's assembler instead. Uh, you, I haven't actually done it yet, but that certainly can be arranged. I, I, I think it's been long established, starting with Apple about a decade ago, that you can use the GCC regression test set suite to test um, Clang LLVM, and that's been widely done, and indeed within my company, Embercosm, that's part of the routine testing. And one of the challenges is how do you make it so that the GCC test suite you know, smoothly works with LLVM? There's no point in the tests internal structure of RTL. Uh, being run on LLVM, um, but I think pretty much out of the box you can run the, the the GCC torture tests on LLVM, and that's a fairly painless exercise, and that's a big chunk of the tests. Okay. I I ran into, go ahead. I ran into a particular problem with LLVM, actually not myself. Some people I'm working with. Uh, they are trying to use the uh, clan to compile GDPC. Uh, one particular problem is uh, in GDPC, there are certain uh, scripts, I should just put that way, they are not a valid C code. Not, they are also, they are not a valid assembly code. We are using that to generate some constant or something. And however, it's not a problem for GCC. GCC because just compile and pass everything to the assembler. And because we only generate assembly code and use that, use the assembly output as some kind of template. However, even for, for CRAM, even if it just want assembly code, it insists to assemble 
the output. Of course, it's not a word, it's not a subject code, we just, the TDC use that as a way to compute something. So, I think that the bug report open against that, but uh, I was told that is done by design. If so, for the client, even if you only want assembly code, it will insist try to assemble that. So that's one particular issue <laughs> make that difficult to compile TDPC uh, with client. Uh, any of the TDPC people like to comment on that specific point? Uh, I think it's just the first problem you will hit because it haps, happens early during build. There's actually a patch on some branch in the repository that fixes that. And the trick is to put the extracted constant into an ASCII literal in the assembler code so it doesn't matter what kind of syntax we use to mark the extraction point for the constant extraction from the GDFC build system. So that that I, I can point you to the patch. Um, but then we will hint, uh, uh, you will hit a bunch of other problems like uh, our use of nested functions, still a few are left, which are not supported by Clang. And you also won't get a correct ABI because Clang doesn't do symbol redirect, some symbol redirects for built-ins like GCC does. Thank you, Florian. Uh, Ulrich, you uh, wish to speak? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jeremy. So uh, just a comment from, uh, I guess it's one of the four people here that develops both on GCC and the client side. So um, on our platform on IBM C S390, um, it's certainly the goal but Clang inline assembly is as compatible as possible with uh, the GCC version. And in, I mean, it will never be 100% identical because the way that the GCC uh, just passes through everything to GAS uh, enables you to use any feature that GAS, explo uh, that GAS exposes, including all the macro facilities and whatnot. This will never work in, in, in Clang uh, inline assembly. But sort of most people aren't using that in that assembly. So for for that subset that is that is used by the major protein in that assembly, we certainly want to be compatible. Uh, we are not 100% there yet, but I can only encourage everybody who runs into the problem just report that as a bug. And uh, we have fixed many of those in the past. And if uh, there are more that are being reported, I'll be happy to fix fix more of those bugs. Thank you, Ulrich. I think that's useful. I, I would say that I can see from the chat column, and remember the chat is recorded and will appear on the website, we are building up a fantastic repository of incompatibilities that need fixing. Um, so um, there, there's a to-do list for someone. Okay. Um, okay. Any more thoughts on interoperability? Okay. Let's then move on to the second priority, which was ABI compatibility. Anyone who saw that as a top priority like to com comment on the issues of ABI compatibility? On you. Uh, my impression, yes. Okay, personally, uh, I opened a couple of ABI bugs uh, in both against RBM, and also other people also opened the, the RBM, against RBI, RBI issues. Uh, my, my impression is RBM, they don't care about ABI to a certain extent. Uh, ben Woodward makes an interesting comment in the chat. It's not just about ABI compatibility, it's also verifiable ABI, and that's an important point. Nathan? Yeah, I was going to say that, that we, Facebook, um, cares very much about the ABI compatibility because we build with both compilers. We use uh, Libstud C++, this GCC standard library, uh, C++ standard library, uh, and not the Clang one, and we expect it all to work together. Um, I don't know. We file, find issues that uh, Jason and or I get to poke at, or we'll talk to the Clang people about and say and, and discuss what to happen. And that, that happened recently with one that Jason just fixed because uh, the ABI is worded ambiguously for a time when C plus 
C++ 98 was the thing. Um, and Clang developers made some assumptions that, uh, um, <laughs> anyway, there was, there, there was some breakage that we had to revert, had to revert something to maintain compatibility. Okay. But but some some of the issues are already fight in, uh, filed in LLVM Bugzilla for for many years and and the comments just hint that they are not willing to change it. Uh, I think the the most important ABI incompatibility issue on x sixty sixty four is the uh, the question whether whether eight or sixteen bit. Uh, arguments are sign or zero extended or not at all. And that breaks in real world many, many projects, which for instance, use uh, C++11 uh, typed enums. I think there are a couple for this particular issue, there are a couple uh, uh, discussions on the API uh, forum. I do not remember the uh, the conclusion as the uh, I think what have I think what should be if the uh, okay let me see what have I seen during this if it is undef unspecified by the ABI and the compiler cannot assume anything something like this. I recall hitting this Sorry. problem with. Uh, Florian, Florian, you've been up for a bit, and then we'll, I'll bring, I'll come back to you, Nathan. Florian, uh, I would like to point out that this goes both ways. So we have a long-standing ABI bug for GCC on 32-bit I386, and possibly other targets about atomic alignments for 64-bit integers, where the the alignment is not correct and. Clang does it differently and arguably more correctly, and yet we don't change GCC. So, sort of, sort of goes both ways. Nathan, you wanted to comment? Um, yes, yeah, specifically about the sign extension one, because I remember hitting this uh, Paris GCC ports, and it was GCC t seemed to have historically done the extension in both places, and then on certainly some ports and. It was hard to make it not to do that. Um, and then we left with the pragmatic state of having to work with old code that didn't do it in the right places. Whereas I think from what HJ is saying that uh, Clang's attitude is, well, the rest of the, the broken world should fix itself. Um, and and uh, the GCC approach appears to be, we have to work with the broken world, um, you know, characterize them in coarse ways, which is unfortunate. Uh, yeah, and hopefully this sort of vehicle can be get us talking so we stop characterising each other. Um, I, I think my experience of working in both communities is they each have their great strengths and they each have their weaknesses. Um, neither of us is perfect. Sarah, yes, did you want to comment? Oh, no, you're holding up a three-minute warning. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got three minutes left. Very quickly, um, the other two topics that people raised were communication chan channels and language standards. Um, I'm going to pick communication channels if anyone wants to talk about that first, just because language standards could take us another three hours. Um, anyone wish to comment on communication channels? At least for the, the kernel standpoint, um, you know, implementing new features in the language. Uh, I think yesterday I sent out a mail trying to get a kernel specific mailing list a, that's toolchain agnostic set up. Um, one of the things I'd like to see is whenever someone needs a new extension of the language, maybe kernel from a kernel developer standpoint that they post, you know, what are we trying to do here? And then kind of let the tool chain folks sort out, you know, what's the best way to implement something like this that works for everyone. Um, and maybe tr try to collaborate on the design and testing of, of the features, I think would be really nice. Carlos, hello. Uh, Nick, how do you see that as, as different or how does the scope change with respect to the Linux API list that we're already telling all the C library maintainers and kind of runtime maintainers to sit on and watch? I guess it's, I'm not aware of any other pre-existing mailing lists. 
there's another one that I should be using instead, then I'm fine with that. So, so I thought that the API one was was mostly for stuff to user space, whereas this toolchain one that was proposed um, is for us talking to toolchain guys. And can we please get the compiler to do so and so for us? Okay, David, do, do you want to comment? Yeah, I just wanted to briefly say that the uh, LVM seems to be using a, a Discord server as opposed to IRC for a lot of things, and I, I've set up at least a, um, a prototype GNU Tools uh, Discord server. I mean, it's separate from the LVM one, but just in terms of discussing communication channels, I don't know if we, uh, and not, not to open a big can of worms during this meeting, but if we want to use that, if that's a, a, a better forum or an, another forum that people prefer, we can discuss that again in, in the future. Okay, that's, that's great. Um, Thank you very much. I'm conscious we have one minute left. I'm going to move to my last slide, which is a poll, which is we've got lots of ideas here. And Nick actually has answered A to one question. Um, there's lots of initiatives here, but it does need people to drive them. Nick stood up. Uh, Carlos has pointed out another initiative that's going on there. I'm going to start the poll and see if we have people that are willing to say, say yes, I think these are good. Um, please vote to say yes, you personally or your company will support these things. Okay, and the polling seems to have stabilized. Oh, one more person voting. I think we'll call it today there. Publish polling results. So, um, I think there are some people who put there, and I have had a quick look, and the, the A's there are Nick and Carlos who are already doing stuff in this space, but I'm glad that people have got companies that will support. And um, I'm glad to see other people are willing to support it. So there is some driver there, but it does need people to lead. And we have four leaders there. So I encourage you to go forward and make these things happen. Uh, thank you very much for um, participating. We have as part of this got an excellent record of um uh of uh, some inconsistencies between llvm and gcc which will if nothing else is a good outcome from this uh so thank you all very much this discussion i'm sure will continue um in a uh, uh one of the hack rooms in due course um we'll make a note of where that is on the uh rocket chat if it's working thank you very much Thank you, Jeremy. So we have now like three minutes until the next session, which is a landing talk mm, about accelerating machine learning workloads using GCC built-ins. Hello. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Do you do you get any echo? A little bit, yes. Okay. Um, how worse is it? Otherwise, I have to switch the headphones. Okay. Well, I think it's not. It's not. Uh, I mean, I can understand you perfectly well. Oh, yep. Thank you. Um. Okay, you got everything you need. You got the slides there. The video works okay. The audio as well. Yes, but I'm just trying to slide. Move to the next page. Yes, it works. It works, okay. Sometimes it takes a little while, you know, once after you push next door back, uh, sometimes it takes uh, one or two seconds to show up in your screen. Okay. Okay, so two minutes.
Okay, it's time. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Raja Lakshmi. I'm working in IBM library optimization team for the power processor. Today, I'm going to talk about some of the recent optimizations that I added in OpenBlast library. These are related to a new Power 10 feature called MMA. There are new compiler built-ins added for this feature to, uh, to help in matrix multipl multiplication. And using all these built-ins, there is a, a good improvement uh, in the performance. So I'm going to uh, talk about all these four topics today. Uh, before we get into open BLAS, just to give a brief about what BLAS is, the expansion for BLAS is basic linear algebra subprograms. These are the routines that help in performing various vector and matrix operations. And uh, this is categorized into three types as level one, level two, and level three functions. Level one of BLAS functions perform scalar vector operations, and level two of BLAS functions uh, contains matrix and vector operations. And in level three BLAS, uh, we have matrix and matrix operations. Today, the focus is uh, only on level three, where uh, I have optimized a single and double precision matrix multiplication for the power processor. There are different types of BLAS libraries distributed by different vendors, but today uh, the focus is only on open BLAS. Open BLAS is an open source optimized BLAS library. So the good thing about this open BLAS is uh, this has optimized implementation of different types of kernel for different uh, processes. And today it is a default underlying library for many of the machine learning and deep learning frameworks. Uh, this library has test and bench source in it so that uh, for anyone who's going to develop a new feature in OpenBlast, it's very easy to use the bench test and um, show the performance improvement and get it accepted with community. I recently added Power 10 support in this library, and uh, there are some optimizations in the gem kernel. So gem stands for general matrix matrix operation, and my optimizations were in the single and double precision categories. Okay, so there's a new exciting feature in Power 10. This is called um, MMA. MMA stands for Matrix Multiplier Assist. Today, most of the operations in the neural network require some form of matrix multiplication, and this particular feature is definitely going to help in that space. This feature introduces three different things. The first one is uh, it, it, it introduces eight 512 bit accumulators. So, accumulators are like um, software managed shadow of four VSRs, four vector scalar registers. So each accumulator is going to contain four 1.8-bit rows. So totally 512-bit, and there are four rows in it. If the input matrices of, are of type float, then this accumulator is a four by four array. In case of the input matrix is of double type, then accumulator can be like, it's like a four by two array of floating points, which you that. The second thing that this feature adds is a set of instructions to transfer the content from VSRs to accumulators and from accumulators back to VSRs. Uh, the third important thing, thing is the set of outer product instructions that are going to help in our uh, matrix multiplication now. So the next slide talks about this outer product instruction. So this is the structure of uh, the new instructions that are now added. This instruction starts with um, characters X, V, followed by the type. Uh, the supported types today are uh, float32, uh, double binary float16, IEEE float16, int4, int8, and int16. So for the type, uh, for float, it, it says f32, followed by characters dr, and then the rank. So rank is the number of rows that this particular instruction is going to update at that time. So for example, for single position, this particular instruction is going to update one row of the matrix, so it's a, it's a rank one update. This, this picture explains the input and output of this instruction. So there are three inputs for this new instruction. It's going to take elements, of, I mean, inputs from matrix A, inputs from matrix B, and accumulator. So what happens is uh, elements A gets multiplied with elements B, and then it's, the result is added to whatever result that was there in accumulator and, and stored back in accumulator. So the input and out, output accumulators are the same. 
in the right hand side picture this this explains a single precision 4 by 4 computer so four elements of matrix a gets multiplied with four elements of matrix b here that means each element from a is going to get multiplied with all the four elements of b so there are 16 floating floating point thirty-two elements here that's going to get saved in the accumulator so accumulator is like four by four it's a five twelve bit so it can contain all these 16 results here So this is this is how uh, the inner loop generally looks like. Assuming that the data is processed and transposed, and it is ready uh, for the matrix multiplication, the inner loop looks like this. Uh, let's assume m and n are number four, and k is sixteen. That means there are sixteen columns in matrix A, and this is the matrix B where uh, sixteen rows and four columns. So the loop, the loop is going to look like this. Row, load one column from matrix A, that's the blue column, and then load blue row from matrix B. And this M and N gets multiplied using this instruction, uh, using the XDF instruction that I just explained. So if there are 16 columns in matrix A, this is going to take 16 XDF instructions, and the result will be in the accumulator, which is a four by four array. In case of power 9, uh, what happens is we use uh, vector multiply with that's going to take 16 into 4. So there are 64 instructions in case of power 9, but with this feature in power 10, it's like reduced to 16 instructions now. So the same will be repeated for 16. That's how the inner loop looks like for any matrix multiplication. Okay, so now that we talked about what this feature is, uh, so ISA 3.1 of our PC has added all these MMA instructions, and uh, recently in GCC 10.2, uh, support for these instructions are like added, and uh, there are new built-in MMA functions added in GCC 10.2. So some of the built-ins that I use in OpenBlast now are listed here. Uh, XVF32 GER is what I just explained. It's, take, it's going to take uh, input from matrix 1, input from matrix 2, and the vector quad is the, uh, is the result accumulator where the result is going to get stored. So the difference between GER and GRPP is, in, in case of GRPP, the, the, res, the result is going to get added with the accumulator, but in case of GER, it's just going to store it. The result will not get added added to the previously stored results in accumulator. So now that they, there is a feature and there are built-ins for that. In Power9 today, uh, the, the I mean, for, for these kernels, it, it, it uses handwritten assembly version. So for the SGEM and BGEM kernels, there are like 6,000 lines of assembly code in Power9. And when I started to uh, optimize this, matrix multiplication kernel for power 10 there were no built-ins and they started to write everything in assembly later uh, when these built-ins are available i converted my code uh, from assembly to c code since i already had a assembly version implemented i could easily benchmark between these two versions so i had a power 10 assembly version of the sgm kernel and i also have a, a c code using these new built-ins for the sgm kernel I could easily benchmark between these two and the performance was really uh, closer. So I decided to go with the built-ins. Uh, this is going to help in future maintenance and it is, it is definitely easy to debug in future. So the lines of code reduced from 6K to 1K just for the SGM and, and similarly for the other double precision kernels as well. So these built-ins are also now used in other libraries like ICANN today. We also have plans to introduce in another one more library called Bliss, where we are going to introduce the low precision matrix multiplication kernels. So the result of this conclusion is up to 4x improvements noted in the power 10 simulator depending on various state factors compared to power 9. So that's a good improvement that we have noted. These are the references that I talk about. The first one uh, is a link that explains these built-in functions and the second link has all the optimizations that I just talked about. Thank you.
Thank you. Do we have any question? Okay, so we have five minutes until the next lighting talk. Where are you getting that? Andrew? Ah, there you are. Can you please say something so we can make sure your audio is working properly? Okay, so, so the audio is not working. Okay, let's see if that works.
Okay, Andrew, now I see that you are mute. Yeah, so now it looks like you are connected using computer audio, which looks like an improvement. Can you try to unmute and say something? You are mute, you are still mute. So, can you try please to unmute? Um, I will not worry that much about the video because what we absolutely need is the audio for the for the talk. So I still see that you are mute. Ah, now you are not mute any longer, but I can't hear you. Okay, now you are mute again. Can can anybody actually hear me? I can hear. I can hear you just fine. Ah, okay. I was wondering if it was the the audio in the in the in the whole no it channel is. that uh, went Andrew's off. Andrew's yeah. just having Andrew's just having trouble. I don't know. Okay. Well, Andrew, we can't hear you. Um, you look unmute, but uh, still the audio is not coming through. Maybe you have, I don't know, maybe a kill switch in your micro or something. Is it working? Yes. Yes. <laughs> now it works. Okay. Oh. Run. Every time I tried to connect to the echo server, it failed. Yeah, but let's let's not do that. Andrew, we don't have time for the explanation. Start talking. Yes. Right, okay. Yes. I need to get my notes back. Uh because I closed my browser trying to fix it, didn't I? Right, okay. So now, thank you. We've just been hearing about how to accelerate um, uh, machine learning. Now we can learn about how to accelerate things properly uh, using GPUs. So this is an update on the status of the uh, AMD GCN project, which we are here at Mentor have been working on for a few years. Uh, next slide. So 
first of all, for those who are unfamiliar, GCN is AMD's Graphics Core Next architecture, which is for GPUs. And as far as I'm aware, all their recent Radeon branded GPUs have been GCN under the covers. Um, it's not a uh, public facing brand name as such, but it's something that, um, but it, it is what they use recently. And uh, this is the architecture that ORNL, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, are planning to use in their upcoming uh, exascale supercomputer named Frontier. Uh, their um, previous, um, or the current one that they use at the moment, is called Summit, and that runs on NVIDIA, so I guess they're sharing it about. Um, so uh, this is largely what this project is about, I think. Um, the, the hardware is interesting. Um, the GPU consists of 64 compute units, which you can kind of think of as a CPU in, the, in their own right. And each one, each compute unit um, has 3,200 scalar registers and 1,024 um, vector registers, each of which consists of 64 32-bit lanes. So this is a quite a large register file, but it gets divided by 40 when you run the maximum number of threads per compute unit. Um, so if you want to run two threads on it, then you can get half of it. But if you want to run 40, then you end up with 80 scalar registers and 24 vectors. But after you take into account registers reserved for trap handlers, it ends up being 64 scalars and 24 vectors, which is still not um, terribly limited by many CPU standards. Um, so we started this project around about the GCC 7 timescale, but it got first arrived upstream uh, in GCC 9. Um, and that was only the basic um, instruction set support. Uh, you could run the GCC test suite uh, using, um, for C and Fortran, using uh, a single threaded um, runner, rather like using a, a target board that might do in it for any, any embedded developer. Um, when it comes to, when it got to GCC 10 though, we've managed to get the offloading support upstream. So you can now um, build GCC 10 for, and for offload support. So that is using OpenMP or OpenACC to run an x86-64 program in which the, the, the core kernels are offloaded to the GPU. Um, the, uh, we support C and Fortran on the, for, the, uh, for the GCN backend, but you can also do offloading in C++ as long as the offload kernel doesn't use the C++ standard library at all. Um, you can cope with the um, nested functions and the um, uh, and all the other C++ weird things that you get in the inter in immediate intermediate representation, just not the library calls. Um, we currently support three GCN devices, uh, the GFX803 Fiji, uh, the GFX900 Vega, and the GFX906 Vega. Uh, I realize these are not the cards that people typically have at home often. Um, perhaps if you're a high-end gamer. Um, so um, uh, if you have another AMD GCN 3 Plus device um, that you want to work, then patches are welcome. Um, if it's a discrete seat GPU with its own memory, then it will not be even that hard. It's just a question of adding the magic numbers and testing it, really. Um, APUs, um, such as the Carrizo and stuff, will require extra work because of the shared memory and the XNAC feature um, requiring support that we don't have yet. Um, these are just the devices that we have um, that AMD are interested in, in for this project. Um, there's no reason it couldn't work on others. We just haven't done it. Uh, we don't happen to test. Um, and this is a picture that I got from the AMD website of one of their beast um, graph graphics cards. I couldn't tell you exactly which one. It says um, it says it's a uh, Radeon Pro Vega Frontier Edition. I don't think that means Frontier exactly the same as the supercomputer, but you never know. 
Uh, so where are we at? This is supposed to be the project status update. This is where we get into that. Um, in GCC 10, which is the current obviously public release, and you can run this from Ubuntu and there's various other distributions that are building it. Um, the GCN offloading support fully supports all of GCC's OpenMP features. That is the OpenMP features that have been implemented in GCC, not all of OpenMP. And it mostly supports GCC's OpenACC features. The missing um, support is the multi-workers um, because of the way that it, um, we do um, the sharing on the compute units, there's broadcasting and stuff that needs to happen, and that, that support has not made it into the GCC 10 branch as yet, and probably never will. Um, if you really want the freshest stuff, you should go to the development branch, however, it's Devel OMP GCC 10, or OG 10 for short, and that has full multi-worker support. We support um, 16 workers per gang, or um, threads per team, if you're using um, OpenMP terminology. That's the hardware maximum. And you can have up to 40 gangs per compute unit. Again, that's the hardware maximum. And so, and it has not to exceed 40 workers total. So that is, um, so you can have 40 of one worker, or you can have two of 16 workers, or you can have five of eight workers. And then, of course, that multi multiplies up by 60 or 64, depending on what card you have, to um, rather a lot of threads. Um, if you count it in terms of the work items, um, the number of um, uh, vector lanes, that's, um, that's thousands, you know, it's like 2,500 two um, running simultaneously, I think. Um, that branch also has various open ACC improvements, bug fixes, the support for non-contiguous arrays, various profiling and per, uh, and performance improvements, all sorts of this is all sorts of new stuff that we haven't yet managed to get into GCC 11, which is the next thing, of course. And we are gradually um, moving the patches from the OG 10 into GCC 11 as the patch review system allows. Um, it takes time. Um, there's only one reviewer, and uh, these patches tend to be complicated. Um, but um, we're gradually working through, so GCC 11 support is improving. Um, yes, the, G the OG 10 branch is based on GCC 10. It is the stable development branch, but it has the features that are destined for GCC 11. So in some ways, it's ahead of GCC 10. Uh, um, mainline in some ways is behind. Uh, the current development that is in progress is largely around the debug. Uh, AMD um, have a bunch of in-house developers working on GDB, that's, so that's not us, but we're using it. Uh, they have, they are, they are mostly working to have GDB work for their HIP compiler, which is LLVM based. Um, sorry, I started late, so I'm going to overrun a bit, I feel. Um, the, um, they've done a whole lot of work to make GDB work heterogeneous mode. So it's context aware if you, um, you can load both x86-64 and GCN binaries into the same project, and it will automatically disassemble the right mode. It will set, show you the right registers in the right mode. It will... Um, uh, upset breakpoints in the right mode for the right architecture and it shows the GPU threads on the info threads list alongside your CPU threads. It's really rather clever what they've done. None of that is upstream yet. I don't know what their plans are, but you can get it from GitHub um, and you can get it in, and, and the binary release comes with the rest of their drivers. Um, the current one that you can that you get supports basic debug at the ISA level um, but and their future release is planned to support CFI, and that's where we are with GCC2. If you build um, GCC mainline today, you will get basic the basic debug support for the current frame only, and where we I have patches for the CFI stuff queued and ready to go, um, almost just working out a few kinks um, for when they release the GDB that works. Um, 
Yeah, uh, they've also had to make some deep dwarf extensions because it wasn't really made for GPUs. Um, in particular, this in architecture is interesting because it's a 64-bit architecture in terms of memory, but it only has 32-bit registers. So it's one of the only architectures where addresses can span multiple registers. And GCC is not good with this, GDB is not good with this, uh, and Dwarf isn't good with this. So that's interesting. Uh, final slide. If you want to try this yourself, you need to have, oh, I'm switching the wrong slide. Okay. You need to have an x86-64 machine, um, that is to say AMD64, um, with a supported GPU. Um, uh, it needs to be running Ubuntu or SLES or CentOS or Red Hat Enterprise uh, using 64-bit. Uh, and then if you have those, you can install the Rockham drivers from their website. Link is given. Um, and that includes their GDB, includes their LLVM-based compiler um, and, uh, and, and their tools. They don't, there's no OpenMP or OpenACC. It's more like CUDA, um, but not. Um, and then from the, uh, from the Mentor website, you can download the binary tools for um, our tool chain that we've worked on. So the May release was GCC 9-based, but it had a big pile of patches on, so it's closer to GCC 10 in terms of OpenHC support, uh, had, um, on, and indeed it has all the multi-worker support as well. And the next release will be coming out in November, which will be based on GC10 and have all the debug support and everything, and it'll be, um, you know, properly tested by us. Or you can go and build it yourself, and the GCC wiki has the instructions how to go build it. It's also included in, the, in, uh, in Ubuntu repo and probably some others. Uh, that's the end of my um, presentation. So, um, do we have any questions? Well, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. Okay, I blame the um, I blame the microphone button. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now I'm handing over the moderation to to David. Edelson. works yeah yeah yes hello jose thanks very much and great that we have serge so even though we're running a little bit late yeah so, so thanks jose. great job oh. and, and serge you're all ready to go so okay no transition <laughs> so well, I, I mean, <laughs> we, can, we can take five second break <laughs> oh, no, that's okay that's okay um that's just in time presenting exactly um, so uh, this talk is about uh, security flags for both GCC and Clang. And as you probably know, uh, when there is a security issue somewhere, it can be fixed uh, by the hardware or uh, by your kernel through update of the microcode or uh, through your compiler where you may activate some security related flags that make attempt to detect or to prevent uh, some attacks, or you can change your, your code base. Obviously, uh, the lower you are in this list, the more costly it is, and the higher, uh, the less uh, intrusive it is for uh, the end user. So compiler is relatively OK on that side. I mean, just changing a few flags. But uh, you need to know the flags and what are their impacts what they actually do, which requires some culture, security related culture, which is not always um, present in the end user brain. So uh, I'm going to speak to about GCC and LLVM uh, with a focus on C and C++. Uh, we, can, we could arguably speak about Rust or Go when they share some common infrastructure. For instance, some of the LLVM-related security, security flags uh, are applicable for Rust, but uh, it makes it easier for me to compare only for C, C++. And yeah, uh, I'm a compiler engineer at Red Hat. 
So uh, just uh, to begin with, I'd like to point out that these are the default compiler flags for Fedora on Intel 64. And the interesting thing here is that almost all of these flags, expect, except from the debug and optimization ones, are security re related. There is a strong focus on most distribution on security flags. And so uh, getting a good command of them is meaningful. Uh, it's not only about uh, Fedora. On Debian, it's the same. So it's a bit more difficult to access the actual list because it's split in two places. So the first list is not is only a subset of what is actually applied. But basically, we've got a bit more flags on Fedora, but uh, most of them are, are common to Fedora and Debian. They use the same. Interestingly, uh, Debian is patching GCC to activate some security flags by default, even for the end user. So uh, first, I, I start with some kind of bibliography about uh, common security flags. So if you want to protect uh, some libraries, like uh, the standard C library, glibc, or the standard, liber standard C++ library, you could activate some macro. So uh, fortify source or glibc exec asserts. Um, fortify source is not very costly for the end user. It basically adds some extra bound checking to some intrinsics. The interesting part here is that also the, this looks like only preprocessor of flags, which means it should be independent from uh, the compiler. Um, these flags actually guard some built-in calls where there might be some difference. So at some point, Clang was not implementing some of this built-in. Now uh, the required built-in are implemented both in GCC and Clang, but um, maybe not with the same accuracy, especially to compute uh, dynamic object size or object size, which are needed for Fortify source. Um, and on the opposite, the glibc xx asserts are relatively more costly because they check some uh, bound access and such. So I would not, well, uh, it has to be known that the cost is heavier. Next. Uh, uh, some checks can be done statically. So for instance, uh, the well-known printf attacks where you pass the first argument controlled by the user can be detected at compile time and be warned or error on. The good thing with that is that <laughs> there is no extra runtime cost. And uh, in a similar manner, some buffer overflows can be detected uh, when so the array bounds are not too complex and can be computed through a, a range analysis. So this is implemented for both GCC and Clang, but there has been much more efforts on the GCC side on, on that aspect, while um, on the Clang side. So uh, in the LLVM uh, code base, uh, there used to be a quite accurate uh, range analysis, but it was deemed too expensive in terms of uh, compilation time for the benefit, so it got removed at some point. And the actual one is uh, a bit lagging behind uh, the GCC one, but uh, that's for LLVM and it's all implemented in the front end for the warning in Clang. So um, it's not exactly the same, but anyway, uh, the range value analysis is much better in GCC than in Clang, but it's good to have it in both. Uh, this flag is debatable, <laughs> I would say. But what it does is whenever there is a stack allocated variable, uh, it's initialized, while the standard doesn't mandate that, neither for C nor C++. And uh, so the goal of that is to change an undefined behavior into a, a defined behavior, uh, which is compiler specific, obviously. So it used to be proposed uh, for GCC or at least the idea was raised, but it wasn't implemented uh, apparently for optimization reason or execution time reason. Um, the protection it provides is that 
if some uninitialized stack variable uh, ended up being printed, this could leak some information that were in the stack for the previous uh, stack frames. And thanks to that, at least it doesn't leak. Uh, these two ones are for the linkers, so LD, Gold, or BFD, and LLD. They are relatively old ones, uh, 15, they, were, they were implemented 15 years ago, uh, I think. So basically, it deals with uh, dynamic, uh, lazy loading of symbols by the loader. And when you do that, it makes it possible to to run undesired code. Uh, but the, the fix is relatively easy. You load all your symbols uh, when you load the actual program, and then you mark the uh, appropriate page as uh, non-writable. Uh, I, If I recall correctly, uh, one of these two flags, I, I would say railroad, is the default now, and uh, non-lazy binding, binding has to be forced. It slightly increased the startup time, but uh, it also decreased um, um, the attack surface of your code. And obviously, nobody ever makes its stack executable uh, by default, but uh, you could ensure that maybe on some hardware, it's it's needed to provide this flag, but the default is to have it be not non-executable, obviously. Quick comment on your uh, by now. Um, the startup time uh, performance impact is, was long since mitigated by having the, uh, the hashed uh, uh, symbol table lookups. So there's no measurable startup time for that anymore. OK, cool. Good to know. Thanks. Uh, and then with kernel support, you can uh, enable uh, ASLR, which basically makes it more difficult to write uh, reproducible shell codes or attacks because you need to, uh, you can't rely on hard coded address in your attacks. You need to have uh, a leak of the actual layout to, to use the, the address or to brute force it, which is also a, a viable approach. And to do that, you need to compile, depending on if it's a shared object or uh, a binary with pi or, or pick. And you also need to activate the according option uh, on your kernel. Otherwise, well, uh, your binary ended, and it ends up being uh, relocatable, but <laughs> nobody cares. Well, I, it's not used, at least. Um, so, uh, stack clash is an attack where you make the stack and the heap grow so that in the end, they end up overlapping, which is normally detected by the kernel thanks to a guard page in uh, between the two memory areas. But if you happen to jump over that memory areas, then you can have, you can write the stack with the heap or the other way around. And uh, the typical way to prevent that attack is to probe each page when you allocate it uh, through the stack. And so the stack, the, this flag used to be uh, GCC only, but it's now also supported for by Clang, but not for all architecture. It's not supported for ARM yet. Um, and stack smashing, so whenever you, you use a buffer overflow or something to to write uh, at the end of the stack, generally to take control over uh, the return pointer. Uh, there are two different ways uh, to protect from that. So the first one is a stacked canary, which with the idea that if you end up smashing the stack, you end up smashing the stack canary in the end. And um, there is a test for that canary. Uh, and the split stack is just to have two different memory areas to store different parts of the stack. And so for uh, the stack canary, stack protester strong is activated uh, for both Fedora and Debian. It's very uh, common protection and it's not super costly. 
Uh, and uh, I haven't found any reference of that of the split stack or safe stack uh, implementation on GCC, but I would love to be proved wrong. There, it's available on Clang. Uh, the good thing with stack protector is that you can control the granularity of uh, which function are protected or not. You can protect all of them, even if the compiler thinks it's not useful or you, you can let him uh, make the choice for you, which is usually the, the way to go. So all this uh, up until now, all the options were equally supported, at least from a common line API point of view by both compilers, which is a relatively good uh, status, according to me, uh, even so the supported architecture may differ or the actual implementation may differ, providing different guarantees. Um, from a packager point of view, it's nice to have the flags uh, on both uh, compiler to chains. Uh, and now I have a few flags that are not equally supported um, by the two tool chain. So the first one is about uh, Spectre. Spectre, I don't know how to spell that. <laughs> Spectre in French. So there are two versions of that um, attack, the, the, but uh, both rely on training the branch prediction and have that uh, code and have that predictor execute code path that would should not be executed. But um, and thanks to that, we populate the cache and. Well, then you can use a, a cache time attack to guess what is in the cache. So that's the rough idea. And the countermeasure is basically to, cre to create a data dependency between uh, the, the branch guard and the actual data access through a mask, which makes uh, the, cache, the memory access fail if the data are if the branch condition is false, basically. That's the whole idea. So it's relatively costly. It's better to rely on the um, Intel microcode update to patch that. But Clang does have uh, a flag to instrument your code um, to prevent that attack. And I haven't found any reference in GCC. But again, uh, if it's not the case, it's on me and my bibliography. The second variant of Spectre is based on the same idea, but instead of um, going through different branch and executing different and loading different data in memory, you're using a virtual table to execute different function implementation, which uh, if you have control of what in of one of them may may be useful for you. And um, both Clang and GCC have uh, protection against that using basically return instead of jump to do indirect branching, uh, which is very, I find that idea very clever. Uh, and um, so the bad thing is that the flags are different in the two different uh, tool chains which is not uh, super nice from a, a user point of view. And basically, uh, it's because uh, the flags relate to actual instrumentation techniques and not to uh, countermeasure. It's not named uh, minus M Spectre V2. It's named uh, according to the countermeasure. So as they may slightly differ, and the name differs, but it, it makes it uh, more blurry for the end user. And they both have uh, a performance impact. Um, and then uh, to protect, again, return-oriented programming, where you once you get the control over the, the function pointer, then you can uh, use that to jump over several area in your codes, and then jump back to the caller, which uh, if you have enough gadgets in your code, make it possible to run any code. And the countermeasure is uh, generally to to check if the control flow looks legit. So that's CFI, control flow integrity. Uh, it can be done in pure software through uh, the CFI sanitizer in Clang. I haven't found that in GCC. 
And uh, there is also hardware support to, to do these checks um, in both Intel and ARM architecture through CE, CET and BTI. And that's activated through minus control flow protection. And that's supported by both Clang and GCC, which is good news. I don't have any estimate or I haven't read uh, the papers about uh, the actual overhead, but if anyone has information, please jump in. Um, one, so it's not actually a, a countermeasure, but sometimes you want to know if your binary is protected uh, in some way. So a, a possible approach to do that is just to check the flags that were used to compile your binary. So both GCC and Clang, or actually, so I, I wrote GCC, but I double checked and it's GCC and Clang uh, support the recode GCC switches. So you can get this common line information in a, a dot note somewhere in your ELF binary, or you can use um, an OBIN plugin, which is more focused on security, if I recall correctly, and now has support for um, both GCC and Clang. I'm not sure uh, if Clang support is as advanced as GCC one, but uh, at least uh, it's ongoing work. Nick knows more than me about that. Yeah, just, just to say, I mean, it's not as advanced as GCC, but it is, yeah, as you say, it's ongoing. And um, another approach, instead of being declarative about the protection status of your binary, would be to, to actually inspect the, the assembly and look for hardening artifacts. Uh, um, in the same way that uh, this small hardening check script that is available on Debian, so I, I wrote uh, a small repo with uh, very simple and I would say dumb checks for each of the flags I've mentioned uh, in this talk, just to check if the flag is supported by both compiler and if there is an easy to check hardening um, artifacts uh, present in the assembly at some point or in the help headers. So uh, elaborating on that uh, would be super useful both for um, uh, white hat in security teams and also as a post check uh, in a similar manner to Anobin. And it would also be useful to check if GCC and Clang generate the same kind of code or the same kind of artifact or the same kind of uh, protection. So instead of being declarative, being uh, looking at the actual codes, uh, looks very interesting, but it's also more difficult because you need to understand the assembly. But most of the time, it's it's feasible. I mean, the, the hardenings are not too complex and very local, so it, it sounds like a possible uh, approach. So uh, now, uh, small words about uh, my personal experience when implementing stack clash protection for LLVM. So it's nice to have it already implemented in GCC and documented in the mailing list because the only thing I had to do was to read the posts and um, I mean implement the ideas that were already uh, available. I could also use um, the output of GCC as a, a starter for what uh, I wanted to, to generate or to check that we were generating the same things, which is uh, there, are, there were some design choice which makes the output slightly different, but um, that's also a good way to collaborate. I mean, um, one compiler to change does a job and then the other one just adjusts its to change to the actual state of the art. Uh, and there is less friction because <laughs> there is a clear leader when we do so. Um, one uh, thing I was disappointing about, disappointed about was that I could not reuse the GCC test bed because uh, the test the GCC test suite for Stack Clash actually relies on uh, verbose output of GCC and checking some reports while I wanted to check the actual assembly for some test driven like uh, development. So uh, there is room for impro improvement there. Uh, maybe if we if we write our test in a way that only checks the generated assembly and not the LLVM internal representation or the GCC Glimple or RTL or 
I don't know the same, the, the actual name for GCC. Uh, it would help a lot because sharing the test suite uh, is super cool. Nobody likes to write it and everybody wants to use it, or I, I do hope. And so that could be um, an int for future development when we write a, a new protection, write some generic test, maybe in a separate repo, and, and that's much easier. Uh, yeah, I have one minute and only one slide left, so I can elaborate on that. Uh, if we wrote some valgrind like um, plugins that would check that whenever the program is run, the the probe are done correctly by just through execution of the assembly this would also give us some insurance about the quality of the verification and we could test uh, if gcc and clang provide the same kind of protection and that's something that we is not done actually for i've done the test more accurately for fortify and the diff the, there are difference in the results so um, having the same flag is uh, a good first step, but uh, the actual uh, comparable implementation um, requires much more faults. But it's really valuable. And the last slide. Yeah. Um, we all agree that having the same compiler flags is a good thing for users, for packagers and, and such. Yeah, time is up. That's the last slide. Uh, but the implementation may differ. Uh, we need to discuss them before or if someone implements on a particular tool chain, uh, use that implementation as a reference. And uh, there are a bunch of people who helped me uh, not saying too much dumb things. And I'd like to thank them. Here are the names. And that's all. I may have time for questions, if you have any. OK, great. Merci, Serge. So Rien. We're, we're sort of out of time. I mean, we need to prepare for the next person. Any any quick questions? There is some good discussion in the uh, the chat that we can follow up. So excellent. As, as Serge says, it's very important for security going forward. There will be you know, many more discussions about this with the, uh, the whole uh, security of applications and the software supply chain. So thanks for this this great work and the great work of both communities to uh, create the infrastructures to uh, ensure the safety and security of all the software. So, excellent work. Excellent. A good, great comparison. So thanks very much. Sergey, so Ian, are you? Ah, here comes Ian. We hear you. We have the audio problem with Ian. Ian, can you try again? Are you, I saw your lips moving. I don't think everybody's a good lip reader. And he's not muted. Everybody just hold on a second. We'll have Ian reconnect for this uh, very interesting presentation.
Hey, sorry, everyone. We're waiting to see if uh, Ian could get past some technical issues with the uh, the the big blue button infrastructure at the moment. Sorry that we don't have weight music, but we can't afford the licensing fees. You can still sing something. Can anybody hear me? Yay! Now we All can right. Hear you. And yay! Welcome. Thanks for everybody's patience, and thanks for. Uh, the diligence of, of Ian and, and the great effort that uh, of Microsoft's participation in this entire community. Are you there, Ian? We heard you for a second, but then you've disappeared again. Did we lose Ian again? See him moving the cursor, but from can anybody else hear Ian? Okay, so uh, what would people like to do? We actually had this entire track ending half an hour earlier. We can wait for, see if Ian can work, or we can also see if Jose is available and wants to give his talk earlier. I don't know if that's going to confuse people who were planning to attend his talk and expect it in about 20 minutes. Okay, so everybody's audio. Um, I'm good with that. Okay, we can hear Jose. All right. Um, 
Can folks hear me now? I think yeah. uh, the server seems to be recognizing me. OK, yes, we can hear you again. Are you still there? You... Hello, Ian, you, you talked for a little bit, and then, OK, it just died again. So Ian, so um, I guess if people are interested, we can have Jose give his presentation now and hope that Ian, that the server issue is rectified um, in the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, David, um, yes? what you might like what you might like to do is actually hold um, Jose to his time slot for anyone who's specifically attending. We actually have an hour spare within the actual official program at the end here. So if Ian can't get things going now, he could perhaps give his talk after. Uh, yes, I mean, we can do this either way. We can either have Jose start now, or we can have Jose start at the half hour, and then Ian take the, as you said, the, the half hour that was later. So people want to take a break for 20 minutes? And we'll start at uh, 12 at you know, half past the hour. Let's take the break. OK, that's one vote for a break. I guess I can create an instant poll here. <laughs> <laughs> You've got that polling technology there, David. Which is A and which is B? Yes, and uh, break now, or let's see. Uh, a is take a break now, B is to start Jose. Okay. Hey. It's very, very clear that everybody wants to take a break now. So let's. Take a break and we'll start at half past the hour for Jose's talk. And then Ian will give his presentation at the, uh, the top of the hour when we have the, uh, the extra time. Thanks, David. Looks like uh, the audio is staying connected now, though. <laughs> but I will, uh, I'm happy to hold off till 10 o'clock, give folks a chance to break and um, after sitting through back to back presentations earlier. David, do you have the slide deck that says we are on a break now? Mostly concerned for the people watching on YouTube. No, let's see. I don't know. I There's, think it's uh, the, the default deck, yeah. Default, okay. Uh,
Okay, so say so you're there. Yes. Yes, PBS. You know, having a file name bpf.pdf uh, makes your life much more interesting. And we always need excitement in these boring times. Yeah, bpf.pdf or pdf.bpf or, yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's just wait another uh, couple of seconds to get to the top of the hour and welcome everybody back from that uh, refreshing break. So I want to uh, thank Jose for his great efforts with this uh, I mean, GNU Tools track this year. Thanks for being a moderator. Thanks for helping also leading with the uh, Toolchain Mini Conference, which is coming up on Friday. And uh, so, and then uh, also again, helping with the moderation. So, with that, I'll, uh, somebody needs no introduction. So, Jose Marchesi is going to talk about the current support for BPF in the GNU Toolchain when, he, when his, his head is straightened out. So, Okay. No, thanks so, very much, Jose. Take it well, away. Well, thanks. Thanks. Um, okay. I will do my best to not divagate too much in this talk because this is work stuff. So, okay. So, first, I'm going to basically go very quickly over <coughs> the latest developments that we have done on the support for the BPF uh, target in the CNU toolchain. Then I will <clears throat> build very quickly a case about why uh, we absolutely need to generate BTF from GCC. Then I will propose a change in the GCC internals to make this uh, feasible and acceptable, hopefully, by the GCC maintainers. And then if we have time, I have a last slide that uh, well, it's about, you know, uh, using BPF for something else and not just in the kernel. All right, so BPF. BPF, um, I guess everybody knows it by now, but, well, it is um, basically an in-kernel virtual machine. Um, it was originally intended for uh, aiding and specifying uh, packet filtering schemas in a very flexible way, and then with the time it's evolved into a sort of um, kitchen sink thing in the kernel because it's been adopted by many uh, kernel subsystems to do a lot of different things, most of which I don't even understand. But um, basically what we started this project in Oracle, we wanted to add support for this virtual architecture in the CNU toolchain. So, what you see in this slide was uh, the plan as it was the last year, and it is still uh, this year. Basically, the first step was to add, uh, um, uh, well, support for BPF to the toolchain, to the different components. The second phase was to uh, basically to make the programs that we generate um, from GCC and we assembly with the assembler um, basically acceptable by the kernel verifier this uh, still needs a bit of work and to keep it that way because the bpf world is is moving very 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 fast um and then the third uh, phase or the third point was to provide uh, um development facilities to bpf developers um other than just you know like a c compiler and an assembler because we believe that tooling is important for you know for quality of life basically. So what is the current status of all this? Uh, the, the port exists. Um, basically, um, we have a Binutils port, which has been upstream since uh, several months now, since August 2019. 
Um, we have a GCC backend in place upstream as well, which is in GCC 10. Uh, it was released as part of GCC 10. Um, then, uh, since a couple of weeks ago, we also have a GDB port, a simulator port, and also, well, we have also, you know, a, a Deja Knu board description uh, that we hope to use in order to run the GCC test suite uh, on the simulator. Now, uh, the Binutil support is pretty complete, like we are basically covering the full BPF uh, instruction set. Mm. The GCC support is, is well, I would say it's good as well, right? Um, the GDB port, the GDB support is very, very simple at the moment. It's very basic. Uh, what is working right now is uh, you can load a BPF object. You can single step on it. You can uh, set breakpoints. You can look at the value of the registers and change them and so on. Well, and get this listing of this assembler, right? Um, the simulator, which is part of the CNU simulator, so that means that it is integrated automatically uh, with GDB. The support is also quite basic at the moment. Um, most of the instructions are supported. You can use the simulator along with GDB in order to actually execute uh, uh, the programs. And uh, the idea is that we will be progressively adding support for emulating certain kernel contexts in the simulator. Like, for example, recognizing different BPF programs, kind of BPF programs, which are identified depending on the name of the section in the L file where they reside. And, uh, well, we want to start progressively implementing support for that context. So, for example, if you have a, a BPF program that, which is hooked into a, a probe, a perf probe, product, for example, uh, we will try to provide your program in the simulator with a context that looks like what the BPF program would uh, actually um, uh, expect when running the kernel. Obviously, the goal with this is, uh, yes, yes, different BPF program types, yes. And also the kernel helpers. Right now, we only support one kernel helper in the simulator, which is printk. Uh, which we needed first because <coughs> um, the test suite in the simulator, which exists, is based on printk, just, you know, to verify the, the execution results. So that's the idea. Mm, the basic stuff is there. So now it's a matter of adding to it. Uh, for this, we will be, well, this we will talk more about this in Friday in the, in the kernel PPF in the micro conference. <coughs> so I will skip this uh, fast. Um, so this is the status of the port. Now, um, as long as, uh, along with the support for the kernel BPF, so what used to be known as eBPF, but now it's known as BPF, um, and that's it. Um, we are also adding progressively in all the tools and components, in Binutils and in DCC, and in the simulator, support for something that we call XBPF. Now, the name is not important. We can change it if you don't like it. I actually don't care. We can call it XPPF, GBPF, or whatever. The thing is that this is a sort of an experimental BPF, which basically is like BPF, but extended with certain constructions, and which are oriented to, to remove the many, many limitations that BPF as an architecture uh, has. So BPF is not just a virtual architecture. It's an architecture that is has been designed to, uh, to 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 run programs which which run in the kernel, in the kernel context, which imposes a security concern. So that's the reason why the the BPF architecture is extremely um, restricted. So with XBPF, we are lifting some of those restrictions. Currently. Um, we have two extensions in place in both compilers, compiler and, and, and binutils, which is, well, the safe restore called safe users used registers, which actually came to a surprise to me to learn that the kernel actually, the verifier rejects programs because, well, for several reasons. If you actually do the safe and restore of those 
registers, and also we support indirect calls. Well, the main purpose of having XPPF is that it's the only way that we can actually use the GCC test suite in order to, um, to, to test uh, the port. Because right now, there are like literally thousands of tests that will not even compile in GCC because they require indirect calls or they, they require bigger stack frames or whatever. Okay, here you can see a little list of, you know, of coming extensions that we will be adding progressively in this XPPF thing. So the purpose is compiler testing, first and foremost, also BPF debugging, because we will see, well, we will see, no, there is no time for that, but um, with XPPF, we also plan to support things like DORF. And so you can use actually GDB to, uh, to get backtraces, to go up and down, you know, in the BPF to BPF calls uh, stack. And for that, you will get your eBPF program, you will compile it as XPPF, and then you will run it in the simulator and you hopefully you will be able to debug it, you know, more easily, right? And also the last point here is the user land that if we have time, this will be in the last slide. So um, after we got all those pieces in place, now what we are working on currently is to support BTF. What is BTF? BTF is the debugging format which is used by eBPF. Okay, it's similar to CTF. Actually, they have a common ancestor. And this is the point here. When you use the GCC to generate, uh, to, to compile a BPF program, um, minus G should generate BTF, not DORF. Why? Because BTF is instrumental to the mechanism for the mechanism that the kernel people <coughs> are using in order to uh, achieve portable BPF programs. This thing is called core for compiled ones run everywhere. And I tried in this slide to provide, you know, like a simple view of, of what it does. Well, basically the, pro the problem, <coughs> this is very simplistic, hmm? I'm pro you know, because I don't even know all the details of this. So my apologies if something is not correct, but this is at least as how I understand it. Basically, um, the problem with, uh, with portable BPF is that if you have a C program that you want to build into a BPF, into a BPF object and run it in running in some kernel, um, this BPF program usually uses kernel headers in order to access to some data structures in the kernel. Now, <coughs> the thing is that, of course, what headers to use, right? Because if you build your BPF program in an environment having the headers for some specific kernel version, then um, Obviously, uh, if you run it in a different kernel where those data structures may be different, then you have a problem. Now, as far as I understand it, uh, currently or until very recently, the different BPF-based infrastructures like BCC and others, they fix that problem by basically distributing, um, I think, the DLLVM uh, uh, BPF port uh, so you basically will distribute the C code, right? And then you will uh, recompile it on the fly every time you would want to run it in some specific system. But the kernel hackers, they came with a solution for this, which is shown in this schema. So basically you generate your BPF program with the C compiler, and then you generate BPF, you generate BTF, and then you generate some relocations, <coughs> which use that built-in preserve access index that basically in those relocations, they, they, they say when you access some specific field at some specific offset in some specific extract from a kernel header or that is in the kernel, then basically you generate that, that uh, information in relocations. So the BPF loader, which is part in the, of the kernel, even though it doesn't run in kernel mode, the BPF loader basically combines that information, so the BTF, those relocations, and also the BTF of the kernel itself, right, corresponding to the data structures in the kernel itself in the system you are running. Then it combines everything, and then it rewrites your BPF program to do the right thing, to access, uh, for example, to use the right offsets, right, to access those, those fields. 
This seems to work well. Actually, it covers cases that are not trivial at all, like fields which are renamed. Uh, also, uh, see bitmaps, uh, which I think personally that it's amazing that it works, but uh, apparently it worked. Anyway, for this to actually work, we need to generate BTF. And now we go, we come to what concerns GCC in particular. In LLVM, I learned about this by looking at the BPF backend in LLVM. Basically, part of the IR is the backend information. So then, um, in the target in LLVM, you can actually extend a class which is called the back handle base uh, to add support for some additional format, the backend format. At the moment, LLVM supports DORF, code view, and BTF, precisely. In GCC, the situation is completely different. In GCC, there is something which is called the back hooks, which is a very old thing, which are called from many different uh, pieces of the compiler all around, from code concerning the tree in the front end, I guess, also from uh, the back ends when, when you start a new function, when you finish a function, also there are some LTO calls to it. And then, um, as you can see in this slide, there are like that I could find and count like five different implementations of those debug hooks. Now, last year, some months ago, we submitted to GCC upstream support for the CTF debugging format. Uh, our first intention was to use the debug hooks because, well, that's what they are for. But the feedback we got from the GCC maintainers was that they want to obsolete the debug hooks. Um, and then they suggested basically to, to, to rely on the DORF information. So, what we understood by that is that, uh, and please correct me if I am wrong, this goes for the GCC maintainers here. Um, basically, we understood that as a desire basically to use DORF in GCC in the compiler as some sort of canonical um, form for internal debugging information, right? And then um, what they would like to see is new debugging formats to actually hook on the generated DORF, internal DORF, um, instead of on the debug hooks, which, which all that heterogeneous sources, right? So after thinking about it for a while, this is what I propose. This is what we are proposing. And we are not just proposing it, but we are actually volunteering to actually implement it if it is okay. And, you know, if it can be agreed beforehand that this approach is sane or it makes any sense. So it will be two steps. In the first step, basically, we will keep the old debug hooks, obviously, because uh, there are backends and using uh well the xcof you know the the vms debug out and so on and then basically we will be creating in dorf to out we will be creating um a new uh, set of of the back hooks which will be basically invoked from the walk on the internal debugging uh, representation that is actually already performed to generate DORF. Um, and then we will be adding support for both BTF and CTF uh, to this new set using this new set of the back hooks. Assuming that this works properly and assuming that in the future progressively we can actually obsolete or rewrite or transform the other um, the clients for the all the back hooks, then we will. This is what we will basically propose uh, at this point, which is that at that point, the all the back hooks will be replaced by what is today the Dorf to out, probably renaming the Dorf to out blah blah to the back underscore blah blah, and to turn the new the back hooks into the let's say official the back hooks, right, and then to port what is not obsolete to use the new set of the back hooks. I use this go dump here as an example because <clears throat> I don't know exactly all the, the details of what the go dump actually dumps, 
but probably it's still needed. So it's not something that we can obsolete. So we will need basically to rewrite it to use uh, to use this new set of the back hooks. Now, well, the last step is that hopefully this will make everybody happy, right? <clears throat> okay, yeah, DBX out, dropped. I like that. Let's drop it. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> oops. Now. There is one concern that we have, and with we, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, this little oracle world that we have here, and as you have observed in the last months, we are very concerned about CTF and BTF. Is this, this, this coming back here, right? The thing is, DORF is good for almost, uh, well, for a lot of things, right? So we can expect that any application um, which would need uh, the bugging information, the same amount and kind of the bugging information that DORF provides, we can assume that it will use DORF, right? Um, however, well, it follows that the new debugging formats that are arising, which are not DORF, it follows that it looks like those new uh, debugging formats, they will be compact. Because if they were not compact, they will be DORF. I don't know if you follow me, right? I mean, we can assume that the new debugging formats popping around for purposes for which DORF is not appropriate, um, they will be compact. And this raises, oh, well, that's cert is certainly the case for BTF and for CTF. So this is our concern. There should be a way for those uh, backends here, the bugging backends, to specify what uh, the bugging information to generate in the internal canonical representation. So, for example, BTF doesn't does not support it doesn't does not support uh, frame information. So. At the end of the day, there is no need to generate that, that frame information if this is the only application for it, right? And so on. We are concerned about this because one of the advantages of CTF and BTF is that they achieve comp a lot of, uh, of compactness compared to DORF. So this is something that will have to be taken into account. Um, so this is the plan. And any comment from any GCC people? Do you think this makes sense? It doesn't make sense. I'm not talking about the details, but the general approach. Okay, well, um, this is something that we will be discussing probably in the mailing list anyway. So I have like four, four minutes more. Let's go to something that is more fun. I say that XBPF is basically mainly intended to be used for testing the port properly. However, um, by lifting some of the restrictions of VPF, what we basically achieve is that we have a virtualized architecture um, in GCC supported in the toolchain that is designed to be jitted uh, very efficiently. And that is something that I think that uh, we could be able to um, we could be able to use for other purposes in the user land. And this is one example: the Infinity Notes project, which is an amazing project. Well, uh, you know, it's about um, having programs embedded in sections in the L file to provide introspection. That's one of the applications on it, like replacing the lib db the lib thread db. For example, and it seems to me that uh, if we will mix uh, BPF and Infinity, because those are the three components of Infinity: you have the Node compiler, you have the Node testing framework, and you have a client library that basically provides an interpreter, a very fast and a small interpreter that you can embed in other programs like GDB. So it seems to me that if we will want to use BPF for this. Now we have all the most of the of the pieces already. For the node compiler, 
you don't need a compiler for in case of infinity it uses some uh, a superset of Dorf expressions you just use DCC and you can compile from C for the testing framework we have the simulator and for the client library we don't have this uh, because the simulator will be too heavy for this and also it, I don't think it will work to build it as a library but we will definitely at some point write a little lib libx ppf providing a very a fast interpreter um combining this well this is just food for thought right um we could basically um do with ppf some what infinity was basically trying to do with dorf expressions consider glibc for example in glibc mm, we what will end in the infinity nodes could be written in c and you could use you could include directly glibc headers right so you will not need any more any kind of pre-processing you know of glibc headers so it will generate uh, constants that in turn you include well in case of infinity it was in the in this infinity language for and um yeah well it's just an idea i think it will be fun and maybe it could be even extended to do some other stuff for example in the lo in the dynamic loader talk from yesterday i was thinking about well maybe we could have a bpf program that could actually compute the search paths right or we could have a bpf program which would calculate uh, um, one of those checksums that some people were talking about defining describing the um, the interface the abi i don't know but i think that it will be interesting to to think about things like that we can rot user land with bpf in the same way that the kernel people are doing with the kernel you know well rot not rot let's say and um, rich and um, and uh, and yeah this was it okay, great thanks very much jose so I think our, our time is up for this really good discussion in the chat and uh, people interested in this and as, as i said we'll continue the discussion about the uh, transition in the debug generation uh, yeah. email alert. Uh, exciting opportunities, exciting improvement in the infrastructure and uh, modernization of the infrastructure in GCC. Okay. Thank any, you. Uh, any, any final questions or comments, or let's uh, give people back uh, another four minutes or so and transition to Ian. Hopefully, we have the the audio issues all all solved this time. Great, Ian, you there? Testing my audio. Okay, we can. I can hear you. Okay, good, that's probably a good start. Yeah, exactly. It's a very good start. <laughs> okay. Just a second, let me. Hopefully, it stays up this time. I haven't seen it crash since uh, before, but you never know. Let's see. Do I have? Uh, I have a laser pointer. Good. Folks can see my laser pointer. Virtual conference, virtual laser pointer, all good. Um, let's see, how do I take down the poll? Um, maybe uh, your presenter, you have to take the poll. How do we oh. take the poll? Uh oh, there's a poll here. Let's see, clear. Nope, that's not what I wanted. Clear annotations. Yeah, the poll results are stuck on my slide. Are they going to stay there? No, that's fine. Sorry, it was the uh, vote, vote to take a break. So uh, anyways, we've got another three minutes to to go. So hey, no problem. I'm going to stay unmuted, though, because I don't want anything to go wrong. <laughs> Now, thank you everybody for uh, staying late today. I don't know, I know that we're all over the world, so I'm sure for some people this is a bit of a stretch. I know here in Seattle, I'm just 
getting my day started, so it's no big deal for me. Hopefully the talk will live up to the suspense of everybody having to stay longer. Okay, so we're at the uh, top of the hour now, and uh, thanks everybody again, as, as Ian said, for everyone's patience, and uh, thanks Ian and Microsoft for their uh, now you know engagement and participation in the GC's community. We're very welcome to to Microsoft and everyone. It's great that Microsoft is becoming so much more active in, in open source in general, and with a great positive attitude. So uh, thanks to uh, Ian, who's the principal software engineer manager at Microsoft. And let's hear about the, the great work that uh, he wants to describe on uh, exploring the profile guided optimization of Linux kernel. So take it away, Ian. Oh, thank you, David. Um, and uh, William, I will get a PDF posted. I apologize for the, the bad formatting of the, the PowerPoint. I try to minimize the bells and whistles I use to get it to display correctly, but um, I'll, I'll get a printing printout of it. So. Everybody, uh, I'm Ian Behrman. Um, I'm uh, the former team lead for the GNU Linux uh, Tools team at Microsoft. And um, uh, yeah, I was at Tools Cauldron last year. I met a lot of you there. And uh, I really want to thank you again for the warm welcome myself and my team had. And I'm excited to be back this year as a presenter talking about profile guided optimization of the Linux kernel. Um, so, Today, I'm just going to go through um, a little bit about my team, uh, the work that we did, um, how we went about uh, generating uh, some data on PGO of the kernel, and then show the results that we got. So let's get started. So um, as I mentioned, I'm the former lead for the, the GNU Linux tools team. So this is a small team within Visual Studio. Uh, it's Microsoft Developer Tools Platform. and we act as sort of a, a frontline support for folks uh, developing software for Linux or developing Linux itself. Uh, the team is uh, staffed with mostly compiler engineers, but um, we, we cover a broad range of tools, so libraries, compilers, utilities. Um, we work on correctness, performance, security features, anything that teams within Microsoft need to get the job done. Um, we work on a variety of different platforms, everything from servers to clients. Uh, our biggest customer within Microsoft is uh, the Azure Cloud Group. And those of you um, may or may not know, uh, at any given time nowadays, about half the instances in Azure, the Microsoft Cloud, are actually running Linux. So Linux has become very important uh, for Microsoft. Oh, went too fast. Um, so uh, as uh, folks at Microsoft do, we had a a group come to us and say that they were developing a service. It was going to be running on Linux. And they wanted to know if the tools team could help them with performance. Um, usually, when teams come to ask for advice on this, it's about making sure they're setting the right compiler flags, making sure that they are um, uh, using the right tools, that they have the right uh, profilers in place, that they're understanding how to measure their performance. Um, we, we brainstormed about how to help this particular team. Um, we came up with some interesting ideas around using profile-guided optimizations. For this particular customer, when their service was running, they were effectively going to be owning the entire machine or the entire instance. 
Um, and they were willing to build their own kernel. So we thought, why not just rec why not recommend not only using profile guided optimizations for their service, but also for the underlying operating system. Um, one of the complications, though, was the customer hadn't written a service yet. So we had no code for them to, for us to test. We had no benchmarks um, that they provided uh, to stand in for their service. So we kind of went off on our own and just said, well, let's just look at whether pogoizing the Linux kernel uh, can help improve performance of cloud applications. And that's how we got into this. Now, before I get uh, too far into this, I want to uh, give a little bit of background about uh, the work uh, going on here. So first of all, I want to set a baseline when I refer to Pogo or PGO and also link time optimization. These are two really important technologies that I'm sure most of the folks here um, are very familiar with as uh, contributors and users of GCC. But I'm sure that uh, there are uh, a few folks in the audience who aren't as familiar with these. And so I just want to get everybody up to the same level of understanding. So profile guided optimization is a way to tell the compiler how to optimize your program based on its runtime performance. This can be really important because a lot of the code in your program isn't what we would call hot. In fact, a lot, some of the code may never be executed at all in a normal running of your program. For example, your error handling code. Profile data can help the compiler make decisions about uh, different optimizations so that code that isn't executed off often can be made smaller and more compact. And code that is often executed can be fully optimized and take up as much space as we need. The compiler um, can also lay out code and data next to each other. So if a function calls another function or data is used at the same time as other data um, to help with locality. And together, these optimizations can have a really good positive effect across the memory hierarchy. So we're talking less disk IO, better TLB usage, better cache usage. And at the end of the day, this is all a boost on top of the maximum optimization that the compiler traditionally does. The other optimization um, that's really important here is LTO or link time optimization. So uh, those of you familiar with the C++ compile model, the compiler is only getting one CPP file at a time. Um, it then compiles that down to an object file, which then it hands off to the linker. And the linker then generates code for um, the entire program by just stitching together object files. So to fully unlock the potential of, the, of optimization, what we really want is to allow the compiler to see your entire program. And that's where link time optimization comes in. If we delay the optimization and code generation steps until the linker has created or found all the contributions to your program, the compiler can do a much better job of getting that whole picture, the whole program analysis. And LTO and PGO can then work together to get really maximum performance uh, for your binary. And um, to show how this can work in the, um, at least in a benchmark scenario, I have some numbers here generated by my team um, for uh, spec 2017 running on ARM64. Um, this is for spec int, and the key that I'd like to draw your attention to are the geo mean numbers. So this is for the rate, and this is for speed versus of the benchmarks. Um, and you can see here, so we have O2, O3, LTO, and LTO, with, well, it's marked FDO here, but that's the same thing, profile guided optimizations. You can see we've got about a 5% boost turning on link time optimizations, and nearly another 5% boost from turning on profile guided optimizations. And the same thing is repeated over here uh, when we do speed. So these uh, optimization modes, link time optimization, and profile guided optimization, can just boost the performance of your program by just setting a few compiler flags. But we weren't interested in turning these features on for an application. We were interested in turning these features on for the Linux kernel. When we looked for some prior art in this area, um, we found a couple of papers by Yuan um, that described sort of um, uh, an attempt to do this work. Um, the top graph here, you can see some data published in the first paper from 2014. Um, and these are some common cloud scenarios running on top of a Pogo optimized kernel. And you can see there's some pretty decent wins here. Apache had about a 10% win. Some of these other benchmarks are kind of in the three to 5% range. That's pretty good. Down here, you can see results published in the later 2015 paper. And here they claim an average speed up of nearly 8%. 
So when we found this data, we were pretty happy and excited that there was something here. So we used this as inspiration and then tried to reproduce the results of this paper. Let's look into how we did that. Um, so this is a basic description of our setup. Uh, we used Ubuntu 1910. Uh, we used the GCC and libraries and uh, kernel that were um, attached to that build of Ubuntu. Uh, our hardware was a Marble Thunder X2, which is an ARM64 part. For enabling LTO on the kernel, we did run into some issues. Remember, LTO and PGO are not part of the normal build of the kernel. They're not being tested. And so we weren't um, expecting everything to just go smoothly. Uh, and sure enough, when we did LTO, we ran into uh, some breakages. And I want to give a shout out to Andy Clean from Intel, who helped us understand what the issue was with LTO. And uh, we, he was able to find us a patch to get LTO working. Um, for PGO, we didn't run into any particular issues here. Um, it was just a matter of understanding what was in the documentation and some trial and error. So um, let's uh, take a look then at uh, the profile step. So we chose to use an instrumentation-based profiling approach to gather our profiles for the kernel. So this is the step where you're going to put instrumentation into the kernel. You're going to run it, um, or run your scenarios, I should say and then measure um, the profile of the kernel um, as it's running. So for the kernel, uh, we found that uh, it already supports the type of profiling we needed to do. So we just found the profiling flags we needed, we turned them on, we built the kernel, installed it, ran our scenarios, and then collected our um, trace files out of the kernel debug directory. Not rocket science, this part was pretty straightforward. Once we had the profiles, we're ready to feed them back into GCC and build a full optimized build of the compiler. Our experience here um, took a little bit more trial and error. And um, I just want to call out a step here for those of you who might try and reproduce this. Um, so you don't make the same mistake um, we might have done on one particular run, which is make sure you turn off the profiling options before you build your optimized kernel. Otherwise, your optimized kernel is not going to be as optimized as you think it is. So remember, Turn these off before you optimize. Next, um, we need to get the profiles back into GCC. And this part, um, I wouldn't say it was uh, tricky, but it was a little bit cumbersome. So GCC expects profiles to be in a very specific path. And um, one feature we found really helpful was the fact that GCC can take profiles in what uh, is called a flattened path. I don't recall if that was our term or a term from the documentation. But what we did is we replaced all of the slashes in the path with these pound signs. And GCC was able to find the profile information without having to spread it out across all of the kernel build directories. Um, the next step's pretty easy. You just turn on profile information. So uh, F profile uses the flag you want to use, and you point it at um, where it's going to look for the profile um, information, kind of its root path. Then you build the kernel. And you're going to probably run into a few issues. Because again, LTO, PGO, these are not default options. They're not what people are building with. And sure enough, uh, when we built ARM64 kernel, we did find one place where consuming profile information caused the compiler to crash. But that wasn't going to stop us. We disabled optimization on that one file, and we were able to get our build going. The good news is on other targets, including x86-64, we didn't hit any issues. GCC uh, was able to consume the profile information and build us an optimized build. So that was, that was pretty good. We're really happy with that. All right, so now we have our optimized kernel and we're ready to actually do some measuring. So the scenario uh, we focused on um, that I'm going to present here is Redis. So those of you who aren't familiar with Redis, um, it's a popular database or key storage program uh, that's used in cloud applications. And the fact that it's popular is actually one of the reasons uh, I had my team go and measure this, because our usage data in Azure says that it's, it's used quite a bit. Um, it backs a lot of technologies that people rely on. And we felt that if we could demonstrate a win for Redis, um, it could uh, show usage in this uh, sort of uh, pogoizing the kernel beyond just the customer that had asked us to take a look at this or inspired us to take a look at this. Um, the other nice thing about Redis is it has a built-in benchmarking system. So one can run Redis benchmark, and uh, you don't need to worry about understanding 
uh, details about how you're going to actually measure the program. And it already has some built in built in so we can just jump in and go uh, uh, learning a lot. Um, so what did we get when we ran Redis? So let me show the data. This is what everybody's here to see. So um, here's a graph of the sub benchmarks within Redis. Uh, each one of these represents a particular operation, sort of how many times per second it can put something in the database, take it out, or do another operation. Uh, we ran uh, the stock kernel, 5.3. We ran the kernel built with 0.3, and the, we ran the kernel uh, with Pogo and LTO. The, all the numbers are normalized against the baseline kernel, and you can see this black line here represents our uh, baseline. First thing I'll point out is that when we built with O3, we saw a degradation in performance. So that's the kernel built with O3, not Redis. Um, one can speculate why that might be. Um, I think one easy place to a conclusion to jump to without any you know, supporting evidence is that O3 is going to generally make things bigger. And when you're dealing with an operating system with lots of um, data, uh, lots of code that isn't necessarily being loaded, Building everything with O3 is not going to give you a performance boost necessarily. The third bar in each group, the red bar, that represents the POGO data. And you can see we got a clear win when we enabled profile information across the board in all these sub-benchmarks. Um, so this is pretty good. You know, we got an average probably of about 2 to 3% win. And that's just from uh, POGOizing the kernel, not POGOizing Redis itself. Um, another thing to keep in mind is the Redis benchmark um, doesn't have um, a lot of time spent in the kernel. So the fact that optimizing the kernel gave us a performance boost was uh, really happy. We're really happy to see that. Um, let's see. Oh, OK. So one last thing before I drop off this slide is that uh, this is the data from the 2014 paper. This is the data from the 2015 paper. Um, you can see our numbers kind of lined up pretty nicely with the 2014 paper. 2015 paper claimed a 12% win. And I have a theory as to why it's so much larger. I believe there was a key in line that they were getting under Pogo um, that uh, probably was fixed. Somebody probably forced in line or the code in the kernel changed a little bit. Remember, our numbers that we gathered here uh, didn't match the GCC and um, kernel versions used uh, in the papers. So I wouldn't expect exactly the same numbers. All right, great. I see some questions coming in on. Um, the chat. I'm going to get to them at the end. Um, I should have uh, plenty of time, I think, if I have till 10.30 or 10.25. Because um, we're just about to wrap things up here. So conclusion, we've got, some we've got a win in Redis. That was enough to uh, keep the team positive. We're going to continue to look more into pogoizing the kernel. Uh, one area that we didn't get into yet is that um, we'd really like to get a measurement of core kernel performance. And I'm going to take an aside here for a minute to talk about uh, Microsoft Windows. Now, I know uh, there may be a bit of a yawn here, a bit of like, that's not related. But um, I have a lot of experience with this. And I just want to bring a little bit of my experience to the, the GNU Linux world. So one of the uh, areas that um, Windows, Microsoft Windows relies on is profile guided optimization. Uh, it's profile guided optimization in the Microsoft uh, compiler uh, sort of grew up with pro pro usage of profile guide optimization in Microsoft Windows. So Microsoft Windows has what they call these performance gates. So as code moves between branches, uh, performance is monitored in these gates. And these gates measure tons of different things, but they measure things like file I.O., network I.O., uh, scheduler performance, and basically the performance of many different operating system primitives. And when um, they measure with and without profile guided optimizations, Profile guided optimizations give them a boost on these basic operations by about 5 to 20%. Now, I know that we're talking about apples to oranges comparisons here, but I do think that, uh, I, or I would say, I would like that my team or some other folks out there to start to gather some data on whether or not these same operating system sort of uh, core functionality can be improved using profile guided optimization. Um, that takes me to the last point on the slide, which is that I think a lot of compiler devs here will recognize the cyclic dependency between usage and quality of compiler features. What we found when we looked in the community is that neither LTO nor PGO are heavily used, or I should say as heavily used on the Linux side as they are on the Windows side. So um, I think that there's a chicken and egg problem here of folks 
not necessarily relying on these features because they don't feel that the value is there. And then compiler contributors not necessarily um, improving those features because they don't see a lot of usage in the community. So I would encourage folks on both sides, both users of GCC and um, new tools and application developers that are consuming those tools to work together or somebody going first to kind of put a little bit of pressure to um, add these things. Because as I showed earlier, just enabling them uh, can give really good performance wins on top of everything else the compiler is already doing in common cases. Um, so if we can improve the quality of the optimizations, if we can improve the debug, um, debugability of the output, the quality of the compiler in those scenarios, I think everything, um, you know, all of our users would benefit from that. All right, so that's off my little soapbox there about these things. So let's, uh, um, I'll, I'll answer a couple questions and kind of wrap things up. Um, but just before I do, I just want to give a big thank you to my two team members, Roman and Modi, who uh, did almost all of the work I'm presenting here. They're the ones who gathered all the data, found the benchmarks, um, timed everything, and, and did a, you know work through all the documentation and get everything working. They did a, a really great job. I'm really just presenting their work here. And then once again, uh, thank you to Andy for getting us unblocked on LTO. Okay. Um, let's do it. Um, so I got some questions in the chat. Nick, I guess you're, you probably have a question. Um, let's start in the chat first. Uh, that's, that came in first. So one thing to know about Pogo and Spec, some of the benchmarks is a non-represented trial run which uses. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good point about training data, Michael. So Michael uh, points out that um, if your training data doesn't represent the actual usage, uh, Profile guided optimizations may not give you what you want. And I have a couple of comments there. So first, uh, I would like to emphasize that it's really important to have uh, good training data, uh, whether you're testing a user application or a spec benchmark or whatever it is that you're you know, using POGO for. Um, one of the ways one can do that, so when you're using instrumentation-based profiling, as we did here for our example, you have to come up with artificial scenarios. You need to come up like, what would a user probably do? Let me run through that and measure what's going to happen. An alternative, which is sort of gaining steam in the community, is sample-based profiling. Um, at Microsoft, we found on the Windows side, we found a lot of customers really like sample-based programming because they can sample what's going on like in their server in real time and use that profile information to either directly give that to the compiler um, or even just to analyze to make sure that their homegrown um, uh, would call like uh, profile, uh, I'm sorry, their homegrown uh, profiling scenarios match what customers are actually doing. Um, okay, is it possible to get POGO profile data without the kernel config configuration using perf? Uh, yeah, William, uh, thank you for that question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, I think is perf a sample-based profiler? If it is, um, that would be another way to do this. We, um, we were just in interested in kind of just demonstrating that this was possible, that there was some wins here. So we didn't want to like figure out like in the real world, yeah, we'd want to probably sample the application running in real time or maybe in a test uh, production, test environment, or maybe even a production environment and get that data out. Um, so yeah, so which optimization level is POGO 5.3 used? I don't have an answer to that. You'd have to go look in the kernel, conf, uh, kernel config files. My guess is it's probably either O2, um, but um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Uh, did you report that IC ran into POGO with R64? Alex, that's a great question. And no, it did not get reported, unfortunately. Yes, I know, I know, I know, I know. Um, okay, let's see. Michael says, in the spec case, uh, is there a specific training data to use? Uh, yes. So the spec benchmarks provide uh, three sets of data for your runs, uh, a test set for kind of validating the correctness of the benchmark with your compiler, a train set specifically for doing profiling of the benchmark, and a reference set, which is meant for running the benchmark. So when benchmarking with POGO, you really don't want to measure the exact same data set that you use to train the compiler. Otherwise, you're not getting, um, you're not getting real results. Like if I tell the compiler, this branch is always taken 100% of the time, it will optimize it if it's taken 100% of the time. But in the real world, if it's only taken 80% of the time, 
you might not get the wins that you thought you were going to get. So when you're doing the spec, you train with the train set and then you run with the reference set. And I would, and uh, that's what we did in that example. And you've got about a 5% win from doing that. So Ian, we should probably let, let Nick ask his question. Not just because, oh, oh, by the way, my, right. Michael wasn't asking a question. Michael was saying that there is actually a known problem with the spec training data for one of the, the sets. But we'll I see. Let, let, let Nick. Thank Nick. you, David. Yeah, go ahead, Nick. Uh, super cool to see other people playing with this in the kernel. Uh, we've been using LTO for a couple of years now in our kernels at Google and PGO data as well, though some of the sample-based stuff is a little bit newer. Um, so we have a talk tomorrow. Um, we'd love for you to, to, to check it out and ask questions you know, based on, on our presentation. That's great. And, and we're trying to find anyone else who's interested in, in finds this work valuable and wants to help us try to upstream it kind of thing. Yeah. Um, we, so we, uh, the focus of my, our, like kind of the, the tail end of our talk tomorrow will be like, how do we upstream pieces of these and what, what makes sense and stuff like that. That's great, Nick. Yeah, Microsoft, we're really excited about this stuff. Um, internally, uh, you know, our Windows users are really uh, accustomed to using uh, link time optimization and profile guide optimization. So like the first thing they ask us is, hey, should we turn this on? Or we noticed we're using this package and it's not built that way. Should we be adding those features? Um, so between those requests and security related requests, those are probably the two biggest uh, questions we get asked. But yeah, we're definitely interested in and in see if we can lend a hand there. That's great. Other folks are working on this. Cool. Great talk. Thanks. Thank you, Nick. Um, all right. Uh, so is it pronounced Pogo or PGO? I guess it depends on who you ask. Um, I use both. Um, but uh, you know, it's also pronounced FDO depend uh, for some people. So <laughs> uh, thank you everybody for the opportunity to talk here. Um, yeah, so, 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 so Jakob had a question, I mean, or, or pointing out that with oh. PGO, there, there are architecture-specific paths now with iFunks and other things that can make the, the, the profiling inaccurate. So that's one of the things to make sure that um, as one transitions to different um, yeah. CPU levels or other things. Yeah, that's, that's something we, we saw in Firefox, for instance, and, and it, it's not that, that bad, but maybe we, there should be some way how to work around this and pretend during the training build that the architecture has multiple possibilities or, or something else. Thanks, Jacob. Um, I, answer, I saw Joe Mario has a, uh, a question about the Windows side, and I, I'll answer that because I'm probably the only person here that can. Um, so the way the I don't know how GCC implements uh, Pogo and, and changes in profile counts, but on the Windows compiler side, the compiler um, can uh, try and correlate the counts and so there's a fuzzy match and if it's close enough, it will consume the profile counts on a function by function basis. So if function A has good counts, it'll use those. If function B it thinks these counts don't quite match up to what's in that function, it will compile it as if uh, profile guided optimization wasn't provided at all. So that uh, allows developers to continue to develop using stale, what we call stale profile counts from previous runs. Um, and then before you merge your branch, you need to re you know, rerun your profile counts and, and make sure everything's uh, up to snuff so that all the functions are being built with profile guided optimizations. So, OK. Okay, thanks. great. So, so thanks very much, Ian. It's great, great work. Really interesting information. Glad to see GCC in this applied to, to more parts and used widely. And as you said, it, you can see how to uh, create a more virtuous cycle for the applications in the Linux space and the, the compiler to work better together to improve all of this so that uh, PGO or POGO or however people want to pronounce it is more, uh, more beneficial. So again, thanks, Ian, for that. And thanks uh, to, to Jeremy and to Sarah for helping to run the session. And with that, I'll uh, thank everybody for this uh, great third day. Uh, you can catch up on uh, YouTube for anything that you've missed. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for the fourth day of the GNU2 Tools Track at uh, Linux Plumbers Conference 2020. So thanks very much, everybody. Have a good afternoon, evening, rest of your morning, bedtime, whatever. Thank you, David.